Hello, and welcome to Controlled Pod in the Terrain. We are a multimedia podcast about air and space mishaps, aiming to put them in the broader context of how and why things went wrong. And just a note to those of you that have been with us, uh, we've heard some of your feedback. We're going to try some things to make this show a little friendlier to the audio-only audience. Uh, now to introduce myself and my co-host, uh, my name is Ariadne. I'm the business and industry, aviation industry knowing one. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm the systems and engineering expert, and my pronouns are also they and them. And I'm Kira Dempsey, um, better known as Admiral Cloudberg, and my pronouns are she and her. Okay. All right, we're going to get to go ahead and go to the next slide. Today, we're here to talk about this. Uh, now, this this used to be a 747. It was a big one. It was a white and brown one. And a man named Matthew Bell tried everything he could to have it not look like this. And he tried he tried really hard. And we're going to make sure we tell you his story. Uh, but first, we have to do some kind of news thing. Next slide. It's some kind of news thing. <laughs> this makes me laugh every time. I, this, this, this slide does make me laugh every time I see it. It's just. <laughs> well, we might add music, but we're not changing the slide out. OK, so here we see a before and after of, of an, an illusion IL-76 crashing off the end of a runway after what appears to be a botched landing, I'd say. Um, you know, it, it looks like they they ran, they they landed long, they tried to take back off again, they they didn't. Uh, after it overran, it went down kind of a big embankment past the overrun. And at some point after impact, it burst into flames. So quite, quite energetically, yeah. uh, a large fireball is seen on camera uh, after the impact. So something blew up after the tanks uh, broke up. This IL-76 was allegedly carrying members of the Wagner Group into um, the city of Gao in Mali, where the Wagner Group is engaged in um, various, in the Malian civil war. And I guess we don't really know for sure if they tried to take off again, but it kind of looks like they did. In any case, the plane was definitely not slowing down when it was on the runway. They touched down too far down the runway. They did not decelerate at all. Um, and from the video, I don't think the spoilers deployed on this airplane. Um, it's hard to tell about other braking systems, but without you know, the, without the spoilers, you're not going to have a lot of braking effectiveness regardless. Where yeah, yeah, it's designed specifically for very, very short takeoffs and landings. It has huge spoilers. It has these sort of blown flaps on the back, big brakes, massive bucket thrust reversers. So this is designed to stop in a short distance if it has to. Yeah, and it just didn't. And we probably won't ever know why, because it was a Wagner group plane in a landing in a war zone. And, you know, neither Molly nor the Wagner group are known for their transparency. So I don't think I don't think we'll ever really get answers on this. But allegedly, at least, according to media reports, unverified, around 140 people were killed in this accident, presumably mostly Wagner mercenaries. Allegedly, some people may have survived, but I guess we can't really confirm anything. I think uh, if you look at the video, actually, you can see towards the end of it, um, it looks like they're trying to pull up, um, but they don't accelerate um, and they don't break either. It's just like, I don't know, target fixation or something on the part of the, the, the flight crew. Um, really, really strange. I don't, I don't really understand how that could happen, um, but it definitely didn't go well for them. No, and nothing of value is lost. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is real, uh, uh, real bad, so sad energy. Um, yep, and, yep. and remember folks, if you have a bad landing, you can always go around. There ain't no party like a toga party because a toga party goes missed. Just don't try to go around after you've already run off the end of the runway. It usually doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At that point, you can hit the brakes. Okay, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, now, Kira, this this plane looks quite familiar. Uh, so yes. let's, let's talk about <laughs> Yes, we talked about the Ural Airlines A320 landing in a field last time. But now we have new fun news, which is that Ural Airlines plans to take it off again from the field. <laughs> So they are presumably repairing the damage to the airplane um, and preparing the field 
for the takeoff. I know they're trying to reduce the weight of the airplane as much as possible. They've stripped out all of the passenger seats. We don't know exactly what their plan is, whether it's to, you know, harden the ground somehow, like put by putting down um, wood or metal and to create some kind of makeshift runway, or as I've seen reports that they're just going to wait until winter, until the, the ground freezes solid because it's Siberia. Um, either way, they're going to attempt this. Yeah, either way, they're going to attempt this. And um, if I hope they live stream it. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely fantastic um because i think i think it's probably going to work i think they're probably going to pull this off but if it doesn't i kind of i do want to i do want to be there i i think the uh I, I i think i think it's pretty hilarious that they've erected this fence to try and stop people watching them do this um, the other thing that's quite notable is that they the, there was a report that came out that said that um, uh, during the the landing they'd managed to damage the wing slightly and and the engines also needed some inspection, so they've got to do that as well as presumably fixing whatever they did to the um, uh, the hydraulic system that caused them to land in this this field in the first place, so. You know that that that's kind of fun, right? Well, I think if they're going to if they're going to wait until winter, they should have plenty of time to do all of that. So uh, obviously, though, the you know, so okay, the the elephant in the room whenever we talk about one of these airlines is, as we discussed last time, um, sort of the availability of parts and the sanctions are are pretty crippling. But they have allegedly been able to get counterfeit parts from East Asia, as well as parts that come through sort of third-party shell companies, uh, usually in the UAE. So they are probably are going to get able to get parts for this, but whether this works, I, like we said, it's if they get this airborne and the fix doesn't take, the funniest possible thing that could happen is, is, is this thing lands in a third field. That would be, I don't know, I would, I, I would, feel like I'm losing my grip on reality if that happened. I think let's go to our next third and final news story. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this this is a FedEx 757 which um well it isn't supp it isn't supposed to be like that. It's it's not supposed to, you know the engines aren't supposed to be um load bearing while the plane is on the ground. Well, no. Um <laughs> So this this plane was this cargo plane was on a um, short flight from Chattanooga to Memphis, and they had a hydraulic failure almost immediately after takeoff, on of the um, left hydraulic system, which on the seven fifty seven is the um, uh, the more important hydraulic system. It um, controls quite a number of things, including the normal gear extension. Now there are two different um, backup gear extension methods. And from what we know from the air traffic control tapes, it seems like the pilots tried both of the alternate methods and neither of them worked. Which is not supposed to be possible, right? There's, I mean, there's, an, electric, there's an electric hydraulic pump. There's also a, a P, an electric PTU that can transfer what's left in sort of, they, they, I think right. they call it the fill line, right? After, right, after the, they... the hydraulic fuse blows. But, and they yeah. have stand, they have standpipes in the hydraulic the tanks standpipes yeah thank you to to stop them from emptying all the way so even if there's like the rest of the um the left system has actually leaked out there should be enough fluid trapped below the level of this standpipe supposedly that you can still get the gear down the flaps down and you know these kinds of things but well, the, the flaps it didn't work. The, so the alternate extension procedure worked because it doesn't rely on hydraulic fluid they elect they elect it's electrical so right but there's the other there's the other um alternate flaps thing because the flaps the the flaps are connected to the ptu branch of the hydraulic system uh, of the left hydraulic system so it should have been possible to uh, extend the flaps using the ptu but it, it just didn't happen for whatever reason. 
Yeah, they also were not, for some reason, able to successfully execute like a gravity drop, um, presumably right. because the, the hydraulic system had had gone so far out the, w- the window that the they couldn't even get the doors open. So my understanding is that the um, the way gravity drop works on the seven fifty seven is there's a um, there's a separate so the um, when the gear is stowed it's locked in place up in the in the wheel wells so that positive hydraulic pressure doesn't have to be constantly applied to keep it up there so there is a um there is a completely independent hydraulic actuator with its own hydraulic fluid that's supposed to just undo the lock so that gravity drop can happen and um we don't know why that didn't work i mean it's not supposed to be connected to any of the other hydraulic systems in any way yeah so this this seems like a, a fairly decent cascade of failures um, and the other thing was that because this was a short flight, they only had something like 90 minutes of fuel when they declared an emergency, which I know it sounds like a lot, but when you are trying to run multiple checklists and you're, you're also trying to work with air traffic control to, to get vectors and maintain an altitude, like 90 minutes of fuel can go pretty quickly. So you're going to want to get this it's thing on the ground. Lot, it's not a lot of time to, you know, try to find a way to not, you know, substantially damage this airplane. And um, I guess I say substantially damaged because I think it's it's plausible that this airplane could fly again, depending on the extent of the damage that was done to it. Obviously, the engines are toast, but the airframe itself might be okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's definitely going to have to go to probably a D-level depot check. So they're going to strip, they're probably going to strip the plane all the way down to its bare structure um, and, and, do, and check every single, you know, bolt and, and you know, if they have to install doubler plates somewhere, they'll probably have to do that. This also, I mean, you can tell that this isn't, this is, wasn't even a 757F. This is a converted one because we can see the passenger windows uh, in the plane. So, you know, they they also might just decide to, to send this to Arizona once they just, you know, just sort of get it flying into test pot flight stage and then just send it straight to the boneyard. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, FedEx likes really old planes and they like to kind of run them into the ground. Don't they still have a bunch of MD eighty-threes? Uh they I, had I, I MD elevens, I, I believe. I know they it, have MD elevens. I, yeah. I, I see them with my own eyes from time to time. But yeah, I think they're I, they're finally phasing those out and they're replacing them with, I wanna say triple seven Fs or seven six seven Fs. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh if you if you guys do get a chance, uh pull the landing up on YouTube. It it happens at night. There's a, a billion sparks. It does look like a really good death metal album. Yeah, I would petition for all belly landings to happen at night for extra visual impact. I think that would be great. Yeah, and I think if you if you don't make enough sparks, it doesn't look cool enough. Like you don't, there's it will be insufficient clout. You got to go around to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just go around. All right. Anything else on FedEx? I don't think so. Okay. Um, Next. only a couple of no taps this week. Um, so first one is the. Autobahn, uh, well, we were we sort of we called it this Autobahn Urban Legends, how we have it titled in the notes. And one thing we we put it in the notes last week and we or last episode that we did not get to is sort of this pervasive urban legend that the Autobahn and the American interstates were built to act as emergency runways uh, in an emergency or in basically in a nuclear war. Um, that is obviously not true. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, a BAC 111 tried to land on a, on a decent strip of it and hit a bridge. So. Hopefully we can put that urban legend to bed in all of your heads. Yeah, it's absolutely not true unless you happen to be Swiss. Yeah, they're, they're just freeways. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, Jay, I think you had, you wanted to, we had some clarifications on the exchange rate. Yeah, yeah. So a clarification about Deutschmark exchange rates. In 1971, um, there was about 3.64 Deutschmarks to the US dollar. So my $1,000 for the bribe um, was off by a factor of more than two. 8,000 Deutschmarks is actually $2,312. Well, um, 8,000 Deutschmarks wasn't the bribe. That was the amount of um, uh, Jürgen Botzenhardt's personal savings that he oh, put right, toward, right. toward the purchase of the airplane. The bribe was a lot more than that. <laughs> the bribe was a lot more than that, but it was still, it was, both of, both of these numbers are still pitifully low. Anyway, on to our our story. Our next slide, yes. So what is today's episode even about? Well, the first thing we need to do is talk about lithium. Next slide. 
Yeah, I think this is the wrong lithium. Yeah, this is the not not the seminal 1991 Nirvana single. Yeah, the B side was Been a Sun, which is very thematic, um, particularly for my 90s anyway. Um, maybe the next slide is, has it right. Oh, next slide. Nope. This is weird. Nor are we talking about the 2006 single from Evanescence. I listened to 100 times that summer because it came out the same week I got dumped. Uh, Michelle, I hope you're happier now wherever you are. Um, no, uh, here we go. This looks like actual. This lithium. is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this little scamp up here in the corner. Uh, so, Jay, take it away. Okay. So, um, for all the people who are listening uh, rather than watching, um, this is a complicated slide with way too much stuff on it. Um, in the top left hand corner, there is the atomic structure of lithium, which is uh, three protons, three or four neutrons, surrounded by three electrons. Um, it is the lightest metal with an atomic mass of about seven. No, hydrogen doesn't count. Stop commenting. Not even astronomers call hydrogen a metal, and they call everything metal. <laughs> there are two naturally occurring isotopes, lithium-6 and lithium-7. This doesn't matter for our purposes. Um, both work exactly the same. Um, but it really surprised the shit out of Edward Teller um, during the Castle Bravo test. Yeah, it is the official position of CPIT that Edward Teller can get fucked. I'll just go along with that. I don't know who El Edward Teller is, but don't worry about it. Um, he, he's <laughs> a guy. He's a guy who almost reduced us all to radioactive dust several times. I see. It. Okay. Um, it, lithium is pretty common in the universe. Um, it's very useful in batteries because its ion is small enough that it can actually intercalate into electrodes. Um, you can see this, the bottom left-hand image here is lithium ions actually sort of soaking into the material so that the whole bulk of the electrode material is being used to store this charge. And the electrode material screens the electric charge of these lithium ions from each other so that you can pack them to much higher densities. In lithium ion chemistries, the whole bulk of the material is active, whereas in most other chemistries, only the surface of the electrode actually does anything. Um, this is one of the reasons why lithium ion batteries are such a game changer. Um, it is the most potent reducing agent known. It loves to rip oxygen off of things. It, it just lives for that. Um, this includes water. If you put water on lithium metal, it will rip the oxygen off of that water, producing large amounts of energy and lots of hydrogen gas. Um, and with three electrons, it either wants to get seven, which is very unlikely to happen, or give away one, which it does with absolute abandon. It, it does not want that electron and it will donate it anytime it can. All right, next slide some applications of lithium <laughs> yes okay yeah so you know we've got a cheap little drone uh you know you have power tools the usb battery everybody has flashlight um you know some some home devices we got a little smartwatch here uh tesla at a little you know the electric zero motorcycle over here in the corner um so all of these things obviously what they have in common is that they are predominantly built around a lithium ion battery uh, aka the global the basis of the entire global economy um We've got obviously examples of them here, and I will bet cash money in whatever your local currency is that you are probably in reach with a lith of a lithium ion device right now. Uh, I counted six on my desk, and that was without opening a drawer or turning my head. So, okay, so Jay, we kind of talked about this before when we were doing all the research, but can you explain to me the difference between lithium ion, right? So what's on our, our cars and our phones is different from the very evil little fucker that we're going to talk about today. Well, we're going to talk about both kinds today because there were both kinds on this plane. But um, yeah, so a lithium ion battery doesn't actually contain any lithium metal. A lithium ion battery, actually, you go to quite some trouble to stop it from containing lithium metal. If you overcharge a lithium ion battery, it's possible for the lithium ions to plate out as metal. And at that point, the battery will explode, which is bad. Um, yeah, we do have a slide. Yeah. Oh, we see some lithium metal ex 
some exploding. Yeah, so um, these are lithium metal cells. You may you may recognize um, the ones up in the uh, left hand corner. Um, these are some A one two three, or sorry, CR one two three, or CR five batteries. Um, uh, they're the kind you use in in like old film cameras. They don't tend to use them in digital cameras. I, for... I think you would describe them as a watch battery. The the smallest. Well, so you have that. Yeah, the smallest one is well, what you would call a watch battery, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a CR2012, which is a, um, it's like the kind of battery you'd put in, you know, the remote for your, your car's central locking, if you, if you have something that does that. Um, the other two batteries that we show there are actually the kind you'd put in a camera. They're slightly larger. Um, these are lithium metal batteries um they contain just an ungodly amount of energy lithium metal cells aren't rechargeable but they have extremely long shelf life anything up to 20 years um so they're used in a lot of emergency gear for backing up the memory in things like um the clock on your computer probably runs off one of these unless it's a laptop okay um, this is a really dorky question when i had the either the SNES, the N64, right? So something that, that had, it stored the memory on the cartridge itself. Is, there, is this right. what was in that cartridge? And they would always say, oh, if this battery dies, your safe game will be lost forever. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of battery. Actually, those are uh, um, usually a 2032. So same diameter as the one in this picture, but um, thicker, 3.2 millimeters thick. Some other images that are here that you can see if you're you're watching on video, um, there is an explosion. Um, this is what happens when you upset a lithium metal cell. They are touchy little beasts. They can contain extremely high energy densities, as high as 3,500 watt hours per kilogram, um, which is about 10 times what lithium ion gets. They are extremely energetic objects and they do not need oxygen to give up this energy you can see on the right right hand lower image here this is a thionyl, a thionyl chloride cell um yeah this is the kind of thing that you might use in a flight data recorder to power the pinger that they use to locate it when it's in the ocean somewhere um it's a very high energy battery. Um, one of the big problems with thionyl chloride is that thionyl chloride reacts explosively with water. The lithium metal also reacts explosively with water. So it's just explosives and all the way down. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's just a whole bunch of chemicals you don't really want to be anywhere near. Um, and you know when these when these things actually do get hot this catalyzes the breakdown of all of these chemicals and you end up with gases like hydrogen um and oxygen and sulfur dioxide and you know all of these kinds of very reactive gases that will cause the battery to swell up and potentially explode um so the contents of these batteries is flammable with a flash point that's around room temperature it's it's between sort of 16 degrees celsius and and about 20 degrees celsius um so you know if one of these things is getting hot when it actually vents it's going to come out as like a jet of fire and it's going to be hot fire because it's a metal fire that's happening is that why they exp i've seen tests where they they pierce it with a needle and it's it shoots up it's like a, a literally just a torch of flame yeah yeah that's it that's exactly it um lithium metal melts at 180 degrees c um which is not terribly hot no you that you you make french fries in the oven hotter than that yeah you do um it's extremely corrosive to aluminium um because aluminium is an extremely reactive metal um it's even more react reactive than lithium or sodium, but it's protected by a layer of alumina, which is um, aluminium three oxide that forms instantly when it's exposed to air. But molten lithium will strip this away because it will reduce it 
because it's the most potent reducing agent known, and it will prevent it from reforming, which means that your 2000 degree lithium metal fire is now joined by a 3000 degree aluminium fire. It, it's your worst nightmare. They're almost impossible to extinguish. That's pretty spooky. Yeah, carbon dioxide won't put it out. It will make it worse because lithium will reduce the carbon dioxide and give you soot and pure oxygen. It, it's a nightmare. It, it reminds me kind of of the, I don't know if you know the story of the Bradley fighting vehicle. So for, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Bradley is an armored personnel carrier that was developed by the United States during the Cold War. Uh, it was made with a, a, an aluminum armor that they they were trying to use to save weight, um, but they found that it would burn uh, with this incredible energy when it was hit with an anti-tank round, which you know it's that's not it's not what armor is supposed to do when it's it's hit by by things. Definitely suboptimal. That's not all of the fun that we get here because the lithium metal battery has an electrolyte in it. And, you know, okay, so all of the chemicals inside this thing react violently with water. So you have to have some kind of aprotic solvent. Um, it's usually something like ethylene carbonate or something like that. But to make it conductive, they need to add something ionic. And what they use is lithium perchlorate. Now, Lithium perchlorate is about 60%, a little more than 60% oxygen by weight. When it's heated, it decomposes. So you've got flammable ethylene carbonate, which is about as flammable as um, something like acetone or uh, maybe, maybe a light alcohol like... Um, um, you know, ethyl alcohol, methyl alcohol. It is very, very flammable stuff. And it's absolutely loaded full of this, this extremely strong oxidizer. And there's lithium metal in there as well. So these things are, are basically just fire bombs. Um, if they actually do catch fire, there is no putting them out. It's completely impossible. And they burn hot, and some of the fire is not actually fire. It's just the chemical energy in the battery coming out. So, you know, depriving it of, of oxygen won't help because it's loaded full of the stuff. I think, and I think we're going to get to that later. Yeah, it's With just... the fire tetrahedron. It's... <laughs> I'm remembering that slide now. Oh, God. Um... Yeah, um, these these things have a very long, very long shelf life, so they're very, very useful in industry. You just don't want to have too many of them in the same place because they're quite energetic. Didn't you say you have a bunch of these lying around your house and you don't know what to do with them? They're actually quite difficult to get rid of. Um, so I have... I have a bunch of lithium ion batteries um, that are from uh, an e-bike that, that, that I have. Um, they are worn out um, because, you know, they have a limited lifespan. Um, but the problem is that you can't really, you can't throw them out because, you know, they've got all these toxic chemicals in them. Um, very few places will recycle these things. It's actually quite difficult to get them recycled. I mean, if I was General Motors or Tesla or, you know, whoever is, is making vehicle batteries, I'm sure I could figure something out. But um, I'm just some nerd who lives in San Francisco and I have no idea how to get rid of these, um, these, these batteries that are no good anymore. And just, just take them out onto the street and hit them with a shovel and let them burn out. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like this is this is a problem that's going to solve itself pretty quick, very, very quickly. Yeah, I I wanted to actually, I actually wanted to try and reenact um, some of the, uh, the fire sequences that we're going to get to later. But uh, my wife said that that was not something she wanted me to be doing. So... Yeah, sorry. And then I asked uh, Jay to send them to me so I could try it. 
Um, but I found out they would have to be shipped ground for, for reasons that will become apparent very quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's not great. Um, and uh, then, of course, you know, there's the reason that we put up with these things, which is that lithium-ion batteries store about 400 watt-hours per kilogram. Nickel metal hydride, which was the previous, like, best battery you could get, was about 75, and lead-acid batteries are about 30. So it's more than an order of magnitude over, you know, the state of the art in about 1990 that we're getting with these these lithium ion batteries. It's a huge deal. You know, there's a reason that all of these little flying toys like drones and things only started showing up when lithium ion batteries started getting cheap. It's because they have very high energy density and very high power density. You could discharge one of these batteries at rates that would just explode any other kind of battery. And you can charge them much faster too. You know, if you if you have a Tesla and you take it to a supercharger, you can possibly get a sort of 60% charge in 20 minutes. And that's completely impossible with any other kind of battery. Their chemistry just won't support it. I regularly get 300 kilowatts when I, I, I plug mine into a supercharger. Yeah, and that's like three and a half C, right? Because you have like a, 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 a 70 or 80 um kilowatt hour battery so you're you're charging it yeah you're charging it at multiples of the of the capacity right you can't do that with any other kind of battery they would just melt and and discharging also means that that's the the other reason that if you have a, a vehicle powered by lithium ion that it can dump so much power into the motor instantaneously yeah, I mean, if you look at these um, zero motorcycles, I mean, this is a pretty good example, right? Um, the battery in one of those is about the size of, you know, a full tower PC, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, and it, it weighs, you know, 150 pounds, but it can dump 900 amps into that bat into that motor, into that motor controller. Um, you can you can get peak powers of well over a hundred horsepower from a battery that weighs less than the engine that you would need to do that would weigh, which is is just a game changer for all kinds of vehicle applications. Yeah, I think that's our that's our that's our background on explodey things. So now let's go to the part where the explodey things explode, um, which is flying to the scene of the crash. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay. So today we are talking about this plane, uh, the, the one the one if you're seeing on your screen specifically. Uh, this is a November 5711 Uniform Papa. Um, and for those on audio, we are looking at a UPS 747-44 Alpha Foxtrot freighter. Um, what that means is this is a dedicated freighter. It was not converted from a passenger aircraft like that FedEx one was. This was built at the Boeing facility in Everett uh, to, to be a freighter. Um, it was, uh, this is a relatively young plane. I think it only, it was only about three years old. And the, one of the important things about this being a freighter is that it has this right here, this, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little line that comes right down below the cockpit. And what that is, is the nose. So the entire nose on a freighter 747 can swing upwards and sort of clear the cockpit and they can load extremely long things in there. Things like windmill blades or generators for, for mines. Or like. Vladimir Putin's conference table, even. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Next slide. Anyway, next slide. Yeah. So this was the route of the flight. And I'm going to give you guys a, a very, very quick primer on cargo operations. So cargo operations are a very extreme version of the hub and spoke model. Basically, a lot of this overnight shipping model relies on a lot of feeder traffic coming in um, and, and aircraft waiting all day to make a flight. Usually, it leaves very, very late at night, um, depending on, on where they are in, in the world. And... You've got basically three three big players in this market um, outside of sort of charter carriers like Atlas. You've got UPS, FedEx Express, and DHL. Um, FedEx Express really specializes in sort of overnight delivery, right? They want direct point to point. I, you you drop a thing off of FedEx, FedEx delivers it on the other end. Uh, DHL has sort of vertically integrated freight where they take things all the way from a rail yard. It might go on a ship, it might go on another aircraft, but they control it the entire path of the way. Uh, They're also super national. Uh, DHL will, and I'm not kidding, deliver a package for you to North fucking Korea. They will not ask questions. 
I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. I've actually I've actually had occasion to use DHL when we were trying to deliver equipment into an area that had just been hit by a hurricane and there was three feet of water surrounding the airport and DHL got that equipment to our destination. I have no idea how, but they did huh. it. But we're not talking about DHL. We're talking about UPS. Um, so here's what makes UPS special from everybody else is that UPS uh, does obviously fit about 50% of their cargo is UPS branded, but 50% is what's called bulk freight. Basically, this means they just kind of take it on at the airport and then they deliver it on behalf of somebody else. And what this means very, very crucially is that they do not control the manifest, meaning that at some point, right, everything that goes on a FedEx aircraft has been through the hands of a FedEx employee. But because UPS does bulk freight, that's not the case. And it especially was not on this night. All right. So this was, like we said, but this yeah. was the flight plan for it was Hong Kong to Dubai to Cologne, Germany. Yes. And this was, there was a crew change in Dubai, I should also add. Yeah. Next slide, please. Oh, so these are some of the things that were put onto the plane in Hong Kong and would remain on it through Cologne. Um, so this cargo included um, a lot of palletized cargo consisting of a whole ton of types of different things, but many of these things contained various lithium batteries of different types, lith including lithium ion, lithium metal. There, there were like some lithium iron phosphate tight batteries in here too i don't even know what those are um there was there's just a huge number of them of all different types imaginable and none of this was marked as hazmat um and in fact it was legal for most of these lithium batteries to not be marked as hazmat but, but there were some that supposedly should have been and this was and because of what ari said just a moment ago you know, UPS doesn't necessarily even know specifically what is in all of these pallets of forwarded cargo. So it was the responsibility of the shipper to label these as hazmat, but for whatever reason, they didn't. And so some pallets containing, lith quote, lithium type, unquote, batteries that were, I think, supposed to have been labeled as hazmat were loaded into the um, main deck cargo um, positions five, four, five, and six, among other locations, which we're going to show a map of where those are later. But for now, all you need to know is that's the area located under the aft part of the hump um, on the 747. So behind, so on the main deck, which is below the cockpit level and well behind the cockpit. Yeah, so some parts of this report that we we were reading through are not actually good science. Um, Three of these nine shipments, items 7, 8, and 13, contained lithium-ion battery packs with watt-hour ratings significantly greater than 100 watt-hours. Um, so 8 and 13 were lithium-iron phosphate batteries. Um, this is a, um, a, a different chemistry of lithium-ion batteries that has what we call a negative temperature coefficient. So these, these kinds of batteries don't catch fire. They won't explode. Um, they don't go into thermal runaway. Um, on the other hand, I was reading through this and I thought, oh, watch batteries, that can't be so bad. And then I looked how many there were and there were 50,000 of the damn things on one pallet. That's, that's an incredible amount of energy that's stored in all of these little tiny watch, watch batteries when you have 50,000 of them. Yeah, it was 57,000 of them, in fact. Um, th yeah, there was 54,000 in 18, um, and then there was another one which contained watch batteries that we don't, we don't have on this slide. It's, it's, it's in another, another spot. Just, just mind blowing, really. So all in all on UPS 006, I think we totaled, it was about 400 kilograms of lithium metal batteries and two tons of lithium ion batteries. There appears to be 50, 284 watt hours lithium polymer packs that are bare, not in enclosures or equipment, just on a pallet. And this is 51 megajoules of energy, assuming that they're fully charged. One kilogram of dynamite contains seven and a half megajoules of energy. So this is a sizable amount of energy. 
in batteries that have no protection on them at all. They're just thin plastic envelopes full of incredibly energetic substances. And these were these were 284 watt hours. And just for sort of a, a comparison, your typical EV battery is between 50 and 80,000 watt hours. And that's why those travel by rail. Also, they're really heavy. Yeah. Oh, and when we read... <laughs> We, we read the manifest. We found vape pens, like lots, like you guys, there's, there's so many vape pens on this manifest. Yeah, there's enough. There's, I don't know, there's an incomprehensible number of vape pens on here. So I think we all agree that this accident was, was caused by vaping. Do we, do we get to blame Subaru? That's, that's the question. We could try. Okay. So, so this is, this is obviously a huge fire hazard, right? This would be a huge fire hazard if this was sitting in the middle of a parking lot, but we're putting it on the inside of a plane full of fuel. So this is this is a really big fire hazard. And obviously they've they must have mitigated this. They've they've thought about this five steps in advance. So let's talk about the fire suppression systems on the 747. So next slide. Let's start with um, how fire suppression is supposed to work. I'm sorry, what the hell is this? <laughs> I just okay so so listeners we pulled this from report from from the uh, the official accident report. And this looks like a consulting ass slide. Like I am not convinced I did not make this at some point. Yeah, this is actually in the report. I can only conclude that the United Arab Emirates um, GCAA that wrote this report thinks we don't know how fire works. On page 119, page 119 of an accident report about an aircraft fire. They're like, hey, we're going to explain how fire works. Yeah, and it's not even a tetrahedron. It's just four triangles. I'm losing my mind. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of fire's needs. Fuel, oxygen, heat, love and emotional support, self-actualization of redox potential. No, nobody. That, that, that joke's for all the chemists in the audience. Okay, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, so some of the pellets that we are going to talk about um, were loaded in positions three, four, five, and six. So these are in the um, front of the plane, under the hump. Well, six is actually the important one, so it should be circled too. <laughs> but um, I don't know why the notes don't mention six. Anyway, um, so these are all on the main deck of the 747. So we're going to talk about fire suppression and, and resistance on the main deck of the Boeing 747 freighter. And so this entire open main deck is what's called a Class E cargo compartment. And a Class E cargo compartment is one that's fitted with smoke detectors. Um, that's one, is fitted with smoke detectors. Two, has means to deprive a fire of oxygen. And three, has means to exclude smoke and fumes from the cockpit. So notably, what a Class E cargo compartment doesn't have is any active fire suppression systems. So it doesn't have any CO2 extinguishers. Um, it doesn't have any halon extinguishers. Um, Nothing like this. I mean, like there's a handheld fire extinguisher the crew can grab, but we're not, there's nothing that there's no button the crew can press to you know flood the the compartment with extinguishing agent. I mean, halon or CO two wouldn't put out a lithium battery fire anyway because only some of it is actually fire. Some of it is an internal anaerobic chemical reaction, and some of it is burning with oxidizer that is conveniently packed inside the battery. So yeah. will, th will these so, burn in a, in a vacuum? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, that's delightful. Yeah, it's it's a, just a bundle of joy. Yeah. So again, the the, um, the Class A car compartment has, instead of extinguishing agent, it has means to exclude oxygen from a fire that is burning within it. Um, and it does this by, or there is a switch that the pilots can can flip, which will um, cease pressurization of the main deck. And so the pressure inside will simply leak out until it equalizes with the external pressure. So if, if you're at a high altitude, this will cause the um, a regular fire to potentially die due to oxygen starvation. Um, and the Class E compartment is fitted with a supposedly fire-resistant liner and the idea behind the um, this liner is that it gives enough time for all of the, or it um it it contains the fire for enough time for the pressure inside the main deck to all leak out 
and um, and stir up the the fire of oxygen. So if there wasn't a liner, it takes several minutes for the um, the pressure to leak out when the pilot does this. And in that time, the fire could theoretically expand and damage critical systems. The fire liner is supposed to keep it delayed until that that oxygen deprivation can happen. And so this is designed for fires, you know, of things like I don't know, textiles or paper, where it's easy to starve starve the fire out. Because and you can tell this because the liner is only rated to withstand temps of um nine hundred twenty-seven degrees C for five minutes. Because that's how long it takes to depressurize the main deck. It is not required and actually does not withstand exposure to fire for any longer than that. Um but so you can imagine, as you probably already figured out, this entire system is completely ineffective against a lithium battery fire because that fire is just not going to care. It barely needs oxygen, and it gets way hotter than the 927 degrees Celsius that the liner is rated to. So under such conditions, the liner is quickly just going to become brittle, and then it will shatter under normal flight loads. So it 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 will be completely useless. Yeah, they actually had a section in the report where they were saying that some of these batteries turn themselves into projectiles when they burst. And um, you can imagine that when this liner has become, you know, very brittle, having a uh, an 18650 um, just pelting at it at um, 100 meters per second is going to uh, punch a hole in it pretty effectively. Yeah. So the other feature of a Class E cargo compartment is that you have to be able to keep smoke and fumes that are in the compartment from reaching the cockpit. And the Boeing 747F does this using a positive pressure system. So basically, the main deck fire procedure calls for the crew to shut off air conditioning packs 2 and 3, which supply air to the main deck, while leaving air conditioning pack 1 running to pressurize the cockpit. And therefore, the pressure in the cockpit is higher, so smoke is not going to leak from the main deck, the depressurized main deck, into the pressurized cockpit because the airflow is the other way. At least that's the that's the idea. And if that doesn't work, if there is or if there happens to be smoke just sitting around in the cockpit, the pilot can also open the smoke shutter, which is a door located in the aft cockpit ceiling which can be opened to clear smoke that's lingering around. But it won't help if the fire is still producing smoke. Actually, if it's still producing smoke, it will make things even worse because um, it will it will provide a path to draw smoke from the main deck into the, um, the cockpit, which we'll talk about later. So if we can go to the next slide. Let's meet our heroes. So the date is now um, September 3rd, 2010. It's evening. The plane is in Dubai after flying from Hong Kong, and these two pilots take over. On the left, we have 48-year-old um, Captain Doug Lampy, who has 11,000 flying hours, including 4,000 on the Boeing 747-400, so he's, he's quite experienced. And we have 38-year-old First Officer Matthew Bell, who has 5,500 flying hours, but he has only just upgraded to the Boeing 747-400. He has only 77 hours on type, so he's sort of just out of initial operating experience. And yeah. Sorry for the uh, quality of these photos. It's really difficult to find pictures of either of these guys. So, the accident sequence. Okay, so the first thing is actually before departure from Dubai. The previous crew had noted a fault with air conditioning pack number one. Recall what I was just saying about the air conditioning packs. Um, and maintenance could not get to the bottom of this, but it wasn't a big deal because the air conditioning pack one was working when they set off. So... So this is operating as Flight 006 to Cologne. They depart Dubai at 18.51 local time. The sun has set and it is getting darker. And they climb to 32,000 feet, um, heading northwest over the Persian Gulf. And everything is normal, except during the climb, air conditioning pack one trips offline again, and the pilots reset it according to the procedure, and it resumes working. 
So as they're continuing to climb, they cross out of the Dubai air traffic control area and contact Bahrain, which is just off the west side of this this picture behind Qatar. And um, so they are in the middle of the Persian Gulf, where this roughly where this black circle is. And sometime prior to reaching that location, we don't know exactly when, a lithium battery ignites in a pallet in the vicinity of cargo position 6, just behind the hump on the main deck. And we don't know why the thermal runaway started in this battery or batteries, or when exactly. You know, the best evidence of when a fire started is when the smoke alarm goes off, but there were rain covers over these pallets, which could have delayed detection of smoke. Smoke could have been building up under the rain pallet and it could have delayed detection by up to several minutes. Um, so we don't also, yeah, again, we don't know why the thermal runaway happened. I mean, the report speculates that there could have been vibration coupling via the aircraft structure that set it off or other acoustic effects. You know, it, it's... At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, sometimes a lithium battery just combusts because, you know, they, they want to do that constantly. From some of the post-crash photos, there are e-bike e type batteries in this in this this cargo collection. In these batteries, the only an insulation between adjacent cells is the shrink wrap over the body of the 18650 cell. In high quality batteries, they're glued together to stop them from rubbing against each other and abrading the shrink wrap, which would sh short the battery out. They definitely were not in some of these batteries. Um, just looking at the photos, you can see there is no glue. Um, and it's not like it it could have disappeared. You know, the glue the glue would be there. Even if that battery had gotten really hot, the glue would still be there. Um so we we know that some of these batteries were were not constructed to what we would today call best practices. Um, this is 2010, which is really quite early in the history of these sort of uh, light vehicle type applications for lithium ion batteries. I mean, think about how many people you knew who had um, an electric scooter or an electric bike or an electric skateboard in 2010 you know it was nowhere near as well developed back then so you know it, it's entirely possible that there was some defect in one of these batteries because they they just hadn't got to the point that we're at now where there are these best practices that have been established in the industry the fire so anyway we have a fire and this fire was probably already well underway by the time the first main deck smoke detectors tripped at time 1913. Well, and, um, yeah, so this the fire was probably already pretty large this, at this point, but you couldn't have stopped it anyway because, as we described, it's a lithium battery fire. You cannot put it out. So the pilots the pilots don't know this. They receive a um, an alarm indicating fire main deck forward. So Captain Lampy immediately decides they're going back to Dubai. He takes over control and he calls Bahrain Air Traffic Control and he declares an emergency, says, I need to land ASAP. And Bahrain says that the nearest airport is Doha in Qatar, 100 nautical miles to, or 17 flying minutes to their west. But the captain says, no, we're returning to Dubai, which is 180 track nautical miles to the south and it doesn't look like there should be such a big difference on this map but it's so much more because it takes a boeing 747 at cruising speed like 50 to 60 track miles just to turn around before even going back to dubai so it it would in theory take 27 minutes in a best case scenario to reach dubai from that position and we don't, so we don't really know for sure why he decided to take the longer route back but it was probably a combination of things First of all, they didn't have charts for um, landing in Doha. And also, they would have to reconfigure the flight computer. But for a return to Dubai, they could configure the flight computer to do that with like basically the press of a button. Um, they were also, obviously, they had no idea they were dealing with like Dante's Inferno inside of the, um, the main deck and not like a smoldering box of Cheerios or something. So, yeah. So, guys, yeah. We, we, we ran the numbers. And we are talking about a fire 
uh, below them that is approaching the surface of the temperature, or sorry, it's approaching the temperature of the surface of the actual sun. So if, you, if you're picturing the Dr. Octopus machine, the sort of Dr. Octopus reactor from Spider-Man 2, you're, you're not far off. Yeah, and I totally thought that sounded wrong at first, but I checked that it's actually true. The reason it sounds silly is because we talk about the surface of the sun being really hot, but it's not even close to the hottest part of the sun. But it's but it's really hot. You don't want something that hot on, on your plane. You don't actually want to be anywhere near it. So can we go to the next slide? Uh, especially considering that your plane is made out of a metal that melts at 700 degrees. Yeah. So Kira, I, I do want to ask a, a question about this slide right here. Which is, so you mentioned that they, they wanted to uh, basically give themselves more time to run their checklists. Is it because at this point, CRM is fairly well established and, and we know that task saturation is very much a thing? Well, it would all be spec it'd all be basically unfounded speculation. We don't know why Captain Lampy immediately decided to go back to Dubai. I put forward some possibilities that investigators thought were fairly likely. But um yeah, we we obviously we can't ask him. We don't know. Yeah. So um, as soon as he declared an emergency, Captain Lampy began turning them around to return to Dubai and initiated a descent from cruising altitude, um, while First Officer Matthew Bell began reading the emergency checklist. So the first item on this checklist is to flip the main deck fire switch, which shuts off air conditioning packs two and three to begin depressurizing the main deck. And again, this is going to do nothing because this fire does not care whether there is oxygen. I mean, these, as said earlier, this could burn in a vacuum. And also, even if this was a regular fire, this was going to do nothing because the captain is already descending for approach. And Boeing's guidance is that depressurization as a fire suppression measure works best above 25,000 feet. But at the same time, this kind of doesn't make sense because there, if your airplane is on fire, are you really going to want to hang around at cruising altitude? And actually, the final report points out this whole idea of depressurizing the hold and staying above 25,000 feet is kind of a half-baked idea. Because what they actually found when they tested this is that when you deprive a fire of oxygen this way, it tends to um, to just continue be it starts hibernating and consumes material via pyrolysis. And then when you get back down to an altitude where there's more oxygen during the attempt to land, it will explode back into flames with more power than it had before. Yeah, so basically the whole idea behind a Class E cargo compartment was bullshit, but nobody knew this at the time. Yeah, I mean, land as soon as possible and hope that the fire doesn't damage anything too important before you can do that is basically the best advice. So... Um, so in theory, what flipping the um, this fire switch will do in this scenario is it will ensure the positive pressure differential um, between the um, cockpit and the main deck. So at least the smoke will be kept out as long as air conditioning pack one is working. But oh, yeah, <laughs> about pack one, it's intermittently failing, remember? So one minute after the fire main deck switch was was tripped, pack one died again. So it stopped providing positive pressure to the cockpit. And actually, even if it did stay on, it probably would have stopped working later because the fire eventually started to consume the air conditioning ducts. Yeah, so we, we, we pulled up this from the port. The, the ducts are made from something called, and I'm going to mispronounce this, poly, polyisocyanurate, um, which it, it, it burns like newspaper. Uh, it releases poison smoke. And this was the shit that was out, on the outside of the Grenfell Tower in London. Yeah, it's it's not very nice stuff, but the air conditioning ducts were made out of it, and so eventually they would have burned. So anyway, the next thing on the checklist is to put on oxygen masks, which the pilots do, and these can be set to mix oxygen with the ambient air, or they can provide 100% oxygen. And they should be set to 100% oxygen by default, but for whatever reason, the first officer's mask is set to mix, and we don't really know why. Um, but the masks also have built-in smoke goggles, and you can't put on one or remove one without removing the other. They are, they are attached. They are not a single unit, but they are attached to one another. So anyway, the pilots put on their masks, and those are working okay for now. Next slide, please. So 
Captain Lampy is making an emergency descent to 10,000 feet, and he disconnects the autopilot to fly manually, and he immediately discovers that his manual controls are not working, and he repeatedly says to the first officer, I've barely got control, or I have no pitch control of the airplane. And this is because the 747 is a traditional aircraft, not a fly-by-wire aircraft, in which the control columns are connected via steel control cables to hydraulic actuators located at the control surfaces themselves. And redundancy exists in this system because the first officer and the captain have independent control cables with different routing. Um, while the And then there's also a third layer of redundancy, which is the autopilot, because the autopilot doesn't use control cables at all. It transmits electrical signals directly to the actuators so the issue with Captain Lampy's control cables and why the pilot plane was flying fine on autopilot, but the captain can't, can't control it manually, is that the raging inferno has already killed the supposedly fire-resistant re cargo deck liner and is cooking critical aircraft systems, including the control cables, which run through the main deck ceiling directly above the fire. And when these control cables heat up, they go slack. Or if their mountings melt, they go slack. Same difference. So when the cables are slack, the control column is just going to wiggle the cable without transmitting any force to the hydraulic quadrants. The control surfaces won't move. But the autopilot doesn't care about cable tension because it uses electrical signals, so as long as the wiring is intact, the autopilot is fine. So Captain Lampy is literally moving this control column back and forth to the stops, and the plane is not reacting at all. So he does the smart thing, and he re-engages the autopilot. And the autopilot is just like, okay, and continues the descent to 10,000 feet, where it will automatically level off, and it has absolutely no problem doing this. So next slide, please. By this point, the lack of positive pressure and the failure of the cargo liner are causing a lot of smoke to enter the cockpit. And it's starting to get hard to see the instruments because there's not a lot of ambient light and also smoke is very dark. And so the ca Captain Lampy tells Bahrain that they have smoke in the cockpit and he announces to First Officer that he is opening the smoke shutter. And the shutter does not do anything in this situation because of the Venturi effect. Um... So basically, this vent to the atmosphere means that smoke is being pulled up from the main deck through the cockpit and out the um, the smoke shutter. And it's pulling, well, so it's, this is, yeah. The smoke shutter is also stopping them from being able to establish any positive pressure, even if the pack had been working. Yeah, which obviously it wasn't. So, but um, yeah, and this bottom center image is the um, piece of the exterior fuselage skin where the sh smoke shutter was located as it was found after the accident. And so you can see that there's this, there's this horrifying streak of tar-like smoke residue that was just streaming out of it. Or actually, I don't know if this was the smoke shutter. It may have just been a, um, some other port, but the smoke shutter would have looked like this too. Um, this is the smoke that was in the cockpit, and that must have been utterly hellish. Uh, and I, I kind of want to, okay, so for our viewers, I want to draw your attention to, um, for our audio listeners, it's a yellow ladder on the right. And this is the ladder in the main deck that goes up to the cockpit. Uh, it's, it is normally, it's very, very bright yellow. And you can see which end goes on the main deck, which end goes up the cockpit, because it, it starts to, uh, as it goes lower, it gets gradually blacker and blacker and blacker. Actually, it's probably the other way around because smoke is hot and tends to rise. The um the the bottom rungs are probably the ones that are that are cleanest, and the top rungs up closer to the to the cockpit are probably the ones that are covered with black residue. That's assuming it's not just oxidized because it was exposed to a lot of heat and the sur the surface has, you know, turned turned rusty because that is a steel ladder, right? I mean, I don't know, but it's possible. Yeah. Okay. So so we've got. So Lamp is trying, Lampy is trying to fly, and we've got F.O. Bell is trying to, to set up the, the computer, right? He's trying to get them back to Dubai. Yeah. So they're trying to get back to Dubai, and the idea is that they can land straight in on a runway 12 left, and um, they should, and with Captain Lampy's control cables not working, they are going to try an, an auto land. So that will be, means, that means the autopilot will fly the thing all the way down through the landing flare, basically to touchdown. Um, and 
to do this, they need to enter into the flight management system interface the frequency for the instrument landing system on runway 12 left. And First Officer Bell has a really hard time doing this because there's so much smoke he can barely see the interface. And he complains about this several times, but he eventually manages to get it entered somehow. So with this frequency entered, the plane will more or less land by itself if they can put it in position to intercept the localizer and glide slope signals from the instrument landing system, which is, remains to be seen. So at this point, however, things take a turn for the even worse at time 1920, which is seven minutes since the fire alarm, and they've, they've just finished the turn back. They are now finally headed in the direction of Dubai, and the captain comments that it's become very hot, and then he says, I've got no oxygen, I can't breathe. And what hap has happened here is that the fire is spreading through the main deck, more or less directly below them at this point, and the radiant heat has likely melted one of the flex hoses in the captain's side oxygen distribution system. So there is no oxygen coming from the oxygen bottle to his mask. And he tells the, the first officer to get him more oxygen because there is actually a spare oxygen bottle and a spare mask in a compartment at the rear of the cockpit, but it's not quite possible to reach this while seated. So he wants the, the first officer to get up and, and get it. But the first officer, again, is very inexperienced on the 747. And in the heat of the moment, he can't remember where this is located. He says, I can't go get it. Um, so the captain says, okay, you fly the plane. And he gets out of his seat to go to the back. And he has to take his mask and smoke goggles off in order to do this, which is unfortunately fatal because his last words on the cockpit voice recording are, I can't see, and then he's never heard from again. And he likely inhaled smoke while trying to find the spare oxygen mask and then became unconscious and probably died within seconds or minutes because smoke isn't just CO2. It's also a whole a whole ton of other ex you know poisons that will kill you dead in minutes, including hydrogen cyanide, there's carbon monoxide. Um, or there was you mentioned some other chemicals that were probably in there too. You said hydrofluoric. Yeah, hy hydrofluoric acid. Um, I have worked with some pretty scary chemicals, but hydrofluoric acid is the only one that gives me pause. Um, you can get a splash of that on your skin and be in agony for months and have to have limbs removed from your body. It is incredibly unpleasant stuff. It will dissolve glass. It It is just just awful and if you were to get it in your eyes um it would destroy your corneas almost instantly um, yeah so, you would so be blinded even that by that it. that literally could have been in the smoke um but the autopsy found that his ca captain lampy's cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning and his blood had a carboxyhemoglobin concentration of about 50 percent which is considered severe carbon monoxide poisoning by a wide margin and people have survived carbon monoxide concentrations above that but it's not that all that common so especially without medical treatment so he was probably he was probably dead long before this plane eventually did hit the ground he was certainly unconscious very very quick yeah um next slide please <laughs> so at this point First Officer Matthew Bell, with 77 hours on the Boeing 747, is flying a single pilot in an emergency where he cannot see shit. And I'm telling, I mean, I, I mean that it was way worse than in this pick, which is just like a fluff pick. Um, there was barely anything that he could see, and this is a completely hopeless situation. This is a pilot's absolute worst nightmare to be in this position. You know, he never even had time to try to find out what happened to the captain. He didn't ask, try to call back, like, hey, are you all right? All, all he had time to focus on was trying to save this plane and, by extension, his own life. But he was facing a lot of barriers. For one, 
he was having trouble breathing because his mask was still set to mix to mix instead of 100% oxygen. And this mask has a built-in smoke vent that is designed to keep smoke out of it. But it was having a hard time given the sheer volume of smoke that was here. So it's possible he was inhaling some not very nice things. Not in concentrations high enough to incapacitate him, but probably enough to make life very uncomfortable. And actually, an interesting thing I want to stop to note here is that if a more experienced first officer had been there who actually knew where the supplemental oxygen was, that first officer might have gone back and attempted to get it and died in exactly the same way that Captain Lampy did, while Lampy's own mask not providing him oxygen would have led him to die as well. And then this would have been a ghost plane scenario, except the plane is also on fire. It's a weird weird thing to think about, that that, that could very easily have happened, and it did not. Listeners, one of the things we discovered in our research, and, and so one of one more reason. So everything we discovered about this crash was just more horrific than the last thing. But one one reason we we dis, one sort of fact we discovered that made this cockpit true hell is that Bell he needs to keep flying and he needs to tr keep trying to talk to air traffic control, right? Aviate, navigate, communicate. He now has to do all three all by himself. But to use the flashlight, right, to see his systems and to work checklists, he needs both hands. And in the 747, it does not have what's called push to talk. If you are wearing an oxygen mask, you have to push a button down on the yoke. So you need to take your hand off either the flashlight or the checklist to talk on the radio. So he's he's got to do all of these things all at once while he's flying a plane that is on fire. Yeah. So next slide, please. So by this point, the plane is reach approaching the edge of Bahrain's flight information region. And there are no repeaters to support the Bahrain air traffic control frequency beyond this this radius. So the Bahrain controller tells Bell to contact Dubai on the radio and start talking to them. And Bell responds that he can't contact Dubai because he can't see his radio to input the frequency. There is too much smoke. It is completely invisible. And at the same time, he can't keep talking to Bahrain because he's about to fly out of Bahrain's VHF radio range. <laughs> yeah, so VHF doesn't go around corners. It's too high of a frequency for ground wave to reach past the horizon. You don't get any ionospheric ducting. It's like FM radio. It's, it's very close in frequency to FM radio, actually. Um, so... We actually calculated the range of these VHF radios at these altitudes. At 32,000 feet, it's about 190 nautical miles. And at 10,000 feet, it's about 106. Bahrain is about 260 nautical miles from Dubai. So this is a real problem. Yeah, and the plane is equipped with all kinds of long-distance communication systems like SATCOM and HF radio. but Bell can't use any of these because he can't see them to tune them. This is a very frustrating situation to be in, obviously. And at the same time... What? Yeah. And at the same time, Dubai can't just start broadcasting on Bahrain's frequency to contact UPS Flight 6 because... As an air traffic control facility, they have assigned frequencies and their equipment isn't even tunable. So... So at this point, Bahrain has to communicate with Flight 006 by relaying messages via aircraft, passing aircraft that are in VHF radio range of both Bahrain and Flight, Zero, and Flight 6, as shown in the slide. Um, so they're starting, to, um, they're starting to be a game of telephone that's taking place here. <clears throat> and... At the same time, there's this problem that's about to be compounded because Flight 6 is going to fly out of Bahrain's radar range as well within a very short period of time. And this is a big problem because Bell can't, he can sort of see the altitude, airspeed, and heading input knobs on the autopilot control panel, but he cannot see his primary flight display to determine how the plane is responding to his inputs to the autopilot control panel. So he can set he can set this airspeed to whatever or the heading to whatever, but he doesn't know what the plane's current airspeed and heading are. <laughs> and 
he can't see his navigation display either, so he doesn't know where he is. And he needs air traffic control to tell him his position, speed, heading, and altitude based on radar. But Bahrain no longer has this information because he's out of radar range. So Bahrain, he's in the United Arab Emirates um, flight information region. So Bahrain air traffic control has to call the United Arab Emirates area control center on the landline to get this information from them. So when Bell makes a request to know his basic flight parameters, it has to go through the relay plane to Bahrain to the United Arab Emirates Air Traffic Control Center, who reads their radar, and then it goes all the way back. And this this game of telephone is is so bad. Most of the information is lost during this this process. None of the people involved realize how bad the situation is aboard the flight. Um, and re- to make matters worse, relay planes keep flying out of range, so they have to get new ones who also don't know what's going on. And I think they ultimately used at least five different re- relay planes. And the result of all this is that Bell will ask for his airspeed, altitude, and heading, and then he'll get back only the distance from Dubai like 45 seconds later. So it's completely unhelpful. And there is another option available to him, which is the universal emergency frequency of 121.5 megahertz, also known as guard. And every flight is supposed to tune, have one radio tuned to guard at all times. Um, and in fact, one of their radios on board at flight six is tuned to guard. And so Bell tries saying, Mayday, can anyone hear me on guard? Um, and several planes try calling him back on this frequency, and they're actually heard on the cockpit voice recording, but for some reason he does not hear them. He thinks no one can hear him on guard, and we don't really know why this was, but it was probably just because he had the volume on his headset for that channel turned too low to hear them. That's the most plausible reason, unfortunately. Um, and... You know, if he'd been more experienced, maybe he would have realized this, but, or maybe he was just ta- task saturated. We don't really know. Um, alternatively, it would have been possible for a relay aircraft to tune one of its radios to the Bahrain frequency and the other radio to the Dubai frequency to shorten the game of telephone, but nobody thought of that until later, for whatever reason. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So at this point, the plane is rapidly approaching Dubai. By this time, the autopilot had leveled the plane off at roughly 10,000 feet as it was commanded to do, and so Bell needed to make sure that he was in a position to intercept the localizer and glide slope from the instrument landing system, or ILS, so that the autopilot could follow these down to the runway and perform an auto landing. And other than auto land, there's really no way to get this plane on the runway because he can't see out the windows. Um, so the way that this is going to work is there's a localizer beam in the vertical plane and a glide slope beam in the horizontal plane. And these beams are quite narrow. So when the plane approaches the beam with the approach mode armed in the flight computer, the ILS receivers will pick up these signals and the autopilot will track them automatically putting the, the plane on course to land. And so when when these um, signals are, are captured, then the um, approach mode goes from armed to capture, and that's what you want to see. But if the plane passes through the beams too quickly, the computer won't have time to capture the signal, and approach mode will not engage or just remain armed. So, so flight six is actually on a decent trajectory to capture the ILS at this point, but it's moving way too fast. We're talking 350 knots. That's like, you know, that's like half again as fast as he should be going. And the first officer doesn't know this because no one is telling him what his airspeed is, and he barely even knows what his position is. So he's desperately asking for vectors to the ILS intercept point, but he's getting nothing in return. His desperation is palpable. At one point, he literally tells a relay pilot, you're going to have to do better than that. He's just chewing these guys out on frequency. 
So the United Arab Emirates Air Traffic Control Center also can't directly see the instrument landing system or clear them to land, so they have to call the Dubai Tower for that information, adding yet another layer to the game of telephone, and Bahrain can't get that information from the Dubai Tower because they don't have a landline to there. <laughs> so it's just a mess. So at this point, the plane actually passes through the glide slope beam and is already above it, when Bell finally presses the approach button to arm the approach mode. So the glide slope never had any hope of capturing. Um, he would have had to have, have been informed that he needed to do that a lot earlier. And he also would have needed to know his airspeed and know to slow it down because he's traveling too fast to capture the localizer. So he just breezes through it, bam, like that, it's gone. And air traffic control at this point says through the relay plane that he is too high and fast and asks if he can make a 360 to lose altitude and speed. And Bell emphatically replies negative. There's no way for him to make a 360. He can't see what he's doing. So at this point, basically all hope is lost because he really had only one shot to intercept the ILS and perform an auto landing, but he does not give up. So he puts the autopilot in vertical speed mode and tells it to descend. He extends the flaps, which prompts the auto throttle to pull back thrust so as not to exceed the flap speed limit, and so their speed begins dropping. He also extends the speed brakes, but they barely move because the control cables have gone slack, um, so he doesn't have any speed brakes. He tries to extend the landing gear to help slow down as well, and it doesn't drop. He gets an immediate aural alarm that says landing gear unsafe. And so systems are just failing left and right at this point as the fire is consuming everything. But the plane is still flying. At um, time 1938, Flight 6 overflies Dubai Airport at 4,200 feet in a descent with a speed of about 320 knots. So obviously not in a position to make a landing. So air traffic control informs them that Sharjah Airport is to their left at 10 nautical miles. That's SHJ on the, um, the map for those who are looking at the um, uh, slide. And so Bell asks for a heading, and he gets told the heading to Sharjah is 095 degrees. But he can barely see his autopilot input panel, so we, we, at least we think that's why he accidentally entered a heading of 195 degrees into the autopilot instead of 095. So the plane started turning to the right instead of to the left. And at this point, Bell disconnected the autopilot. We don't, we don't really know why, but it's possibly because the, air, the airplane was doing something unexpected. He was disoriented. He panicked. He tried to take control. He surely had a reason, but he didn't have time to tell us what it was. Yeah, the, the priorities are aviate, navigate, uh, communicate. At no point do they, is it narrate. Yeah. <laughs> so as soon as he disconnects the autopilot, the plane pitches 14 degrees nose down. And this was probably because of a couple things. First of all, the thrust levers had been reduced to idle around this time by the auto throttle um, in an attempt to slow down below the flap limit speed. And this causes a pitch down moment on um, planes with wing mounted engines. And then once the plane started pitching down, um, there was a lot of burning cargo in the cargo hold that was probably no longer secured, and this might have slid forward, causing a center of gravity shift that significantly exacerbated the nose down moment. Yeah, un uncommanded center of gravity movements in a cargo plane are very, very bad news. They're usually almost always fatal. Yeah, <laughs> well, they, they can be, but uh, this, yeah, and... I mean, also the center of the center of gravity is the center of gravity is on fire. <laughs> um, so, so the plane continues turning past 195 degrees because he's turned the autopilot off and he hasn't leveled the wings. He eventually levels the wings. The plane is sort of heading west-ish, and he's pulling back on the controls because he knows he's descending we think, but he's not getting a normal response from the elevators because his control cables are starting to get a little bit wonky too. Remember that they're independent from the captains, which failed a long time ago. So at first, the elevator responses to his pitch inputs were just out of phase, 
and then they slowly ceased responding altogether within the course of about a minute. Um, and during this time, the plane was basically diving from 4,000 feet toward a residential subdivision called the Dubai Silicon Oasis. It's one of those, you know, of course, of course, a residential subdivision in Dubai would be called something like that. I find it kind of silly. But um, anyway... I think they were trying to. I think they were trying to cultivate a tech industry at, at one point, and uh, I think that was, that was like the the re It was a mixed residential and commercial like development for, you know, tech tech startups to have a spot in Dubai. I, as far as I'm aware, it didn't really work. I certainly never heard of any company, never heard of any company coming out of there. So. So as he was messing with the controls, he managed to alter the trajectory just enough to miss the Dubai Silicon Oasis, which no doubt saved some number of lives on the ground. Even though Bell probably had no idea what he had done because he was completely disoriented and he couldn't see anything, there was no way for him to have known that he was flying toward the Dubai Silicon Oasis, but he managed to somehow pull up just enough to avoid it before his elevators totally stopped working. So next slide, please. At this point, the plane is obviously out of control, and it um, it finally begins to impact the ground 28 minutes after the first fire warning. This plane has been in the air for quite a while, but it's finally over. As the plane, the wingtip clips several street lamps on the perimeter of a military base, and then impacts a service road, and the right wing then plows into several unoccupied storage and support buildings, which sends the fuselage crashing to the ground, and it slides into a large embankment, which causes the plane to explode rather rather violently. And de so basically just a storm of debris continues forward and strikes several more support buildings on the military base before finally coming to a stop. And... This has left charred debris over an impact path two, over 2,000 feet long. And it's total destruction through this area. There's just char charred debris as far as the eye can see. Um, obviously, there was no way for Matthew Bell to have survived this impact. He was sadly killed instantly. But nobody on the ground was hurt, rather mi miraculously. Just going to get the next slide. So let's talk about the aftermath. So about nine months later, there was a, a, a sort of eerily similar accident that happened off the coast of South Korea. Uh, in this case, it was, I believe this was Azeon Air, Air Cargo 991. In this case, it appears that a pallet in the aft of the plane, we believe somewhere behind the wing route, uh, caught, uh, was carrying lithium uh, and it caught fire. Uh, the pilots out on the radio that they were losing control, uh, and then very, very quickly after it stated that neither of them had any sort of control. So this is this obviously seems like a very similar chain of events. Um, analysis of the wreckage also showed smoke in the cockpit. Um, this one went sort of much more rapidly, much more violently than UPS 006, uh, because it appears that the fire either burnt all the way through the structure of the aircraft, or it made it weaken that the, air the aerodynamic forces just sort of ripped the entire fuselage apart. Um, the time yeah. from declaring an emergency to ATC to impact was 18 minutes. Yeah, I, I believe it's um, it's suspected the entire tail section of the plane fell off in flight because of the intensity of the fire. Yeah, the the flight data recorder was recovered. It did not have a memory module. They think somehow it it was it was lost in the uh, in the ocean currents. Um, the cockpit voice recorder has never been found. Yeah, so we don't have a real good idea of what happened on this flight, but it was presumably presumed to be another um, lithium battery fire, much like UPS six. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. This means this is the second episode we've done where we've mentioned Asiana. That's true. Yes, yes, it is. Um, that this one was was very much not their fault. Uh, no. So I, I want to talk about Matthew Bell. So he's the he's the guy on the left here. Um, I'm sorry for the poor quality. We we really we tried. We really could not find any good images of him. Uh, to our Zoomer listeners, uh, there was an era lot, not too long ago where you, you had a digital point and shoot 
and that was kind of it. Uh, phone cameras were, were not very common, and they all sucked. Anyway, so I want to let you guys know that, that, that researching this incident was, it ended up being sort of deeply unsettling in a way that some of the other ones weren't. Um, even ones that, that where, where more people lost their lives. And I think it was, it was very emotionally impactful because this guy did everything right and, and he still died. And it, it seems, it seems very unfair. Um, and it, it seems, it seems like, like that, that kind of thing shouldn't, shouldn't happen. You know, we, we, something, something should have been able to have been done. And when we do an episode, we sort of discuss amongst ourselves what we want the, the theme of the episode to be. What, what are we trying to say? And during the research for this episode, I, I decided that the thesis, sort of for me at least, was going to be Matthew Bell was a hero and a legend, and he flew an impossible tiny little sun for a half an hour, and he almost fucking made it. And his last action as a soul on this planet was to turn, even accidentally, to miss a bunch of houses and he saved dozens of lives, even if he didn't know he was doing it. And we just thought his story deserved to be told. Yes. And we we gamed this out a lot of different ways and so did the investigators actually we don't think there was really any possible scenario in which he survives we, we do a lot of crashes and we discuss a lot of crashes amongst ourselves where it's sort of you know the joke of oh i i, I simply would not have crashed the aircraft but in this case i just there's there is no other way yeah that yeah. aircraft is going to be on the ground and it is not going to be in one piece Obviously, the most common one that people ask is, is what about DOA? So can we cover the DOA diversion? Yeah. So one idea is, you know, would the outcome have been better if they diverted to Doha, which would have taken 17 minutes in theory to landing instead of 27 minutes? And so the investigators gamed this out and they thought the soonest a landing could have been achieved was um, time 1934. So that's about 20 minutes after the fire bell sounded. And if we, if we, you know, consider the actual flight, what happened within the first 20 minutes after the fire bell, that means the captain still would have run out of oxygen and died. Their controls still would have failed. The cockpit still would have been full of smoke. The landing gear still wouldn't have extended. The, the big upside would be that the communication problems would have been avoided. So it would have been, in theory, possible for timely information to be transmitted to um, Matthew Bell so that he could successfully align for the auto landing. Maybe. I ideally. However, with the landing gear up, full load of fuel, and a massive fire on board, and the cockpit full of smoke, it's, it's difficult to imagine that he would have su survived because he, the... Um, the cockpit of the 747 doesn't have an emergency escape window. He would have had to walk, get out of his seat and walk back to um, the crew escape hatch. And he would have had to take off his oxygen mask and smoke goggles to do that. So and unless... He would have, he would have had yeah. to have been in good enough shape to actually stand up, which if you've just belly landed a 747 full of fuel is probably not something that's going to happen. We also have to sort of discuss the option that at this point, it's very likely that the fire weakened the structure in a very, very severe, severe way. Um, so that the aircraft might not have even landed intact. And this is especially true for the next one, which is what if he had been able to successfully intercept the glide slope at DX? Yeah, then the outcome would have been basically, yeah, it would have, it would have been basically the same outcome that I just described, just in a different location, essentially. Yeah, the, the the last one that we kind of want to discuss is is ditching, right? So trying to land the aircraft somewhere in the Persian Gulf. And and on its face, this is not the most ridiculous idea, especially if if for some reason they had the idea to do this immediately after the fire bell sounded. The Persian Gulf tends to be fairly calm waters. It's it's very warm. Um, but it, we will say that it, it's dark. Uh, the sea is it can change very quickly. And the 747 is not a float plane. Um, this was a scenario that was so sort of unpredictable with so many different variables that the UAE uh, GCAA did not even choose to speculate. They had a section saying, we we are not even going to try and run this as a simulation because it's just, there's too many variables for this to have any meaningful result as part of the investigation. 
Yeah, not to mention it, that it's really hard to, you can't, you know, the autopilot can't do a ditching. You would have to be flown manually. And by the time they got down there, it would be very likely that at least the captain's control controls were not working properly. And there probably would have been smoke in the cockpit anyway. So it would have been really difficult to see where the water was. It just, it it wouldn't end. It wouldn't end well, in my opinion. In, in any case, it's difficult to see where the water is at night. Um, the other thing that, that you need to remember is that after ditching, you've got a plane that's probably in pieces that has leaked out all of this jet fuel. Oh, and did I mention that lithium metal reacts violently with seawater and it floats? So you've got this built-in igniter for all of this fuel that you are now floating in the middle of. Yeah, it, Good wouldn't, luck. it wouldn't be very nice. It wouldn't, it wouldn't go well. So we, we did, amongst ourselves, though, discuss one possible option that was not tried. And I want you guys to remember when we talked about the, that this was a 747 freighter and it has a nose that swings up. Now, it is possible for the crew of a 747 to override these safety interlocks and open the nose. And we just thought, do it. Do it, you fucking legend. Just, that's real, real I'll see you in hell energy. Yeah, just just, just open it. Who cares about the consequences? <laughs> I mean, literally, what's what's the worst that could happen? Like, sort of, and then, and then point the nose straight down, like Memphis Bell. Also, for legal reasons, this is a joke. Uh, next slide. Another silly idea we came up with. The Pallet Yeater 9001 is clearly the solution here. You can see a proof of concept above. Um, I believe that the U.S. military has a number of these. The U.S. military is in. The United States Air Force is very, very good at pallet eating. I, I have yeah. seen Star Trek. I have seen Star Trek. If you have a problem, you dump the contents of the cargo bay. Very simple. Yeah. And, you know, in these episodes, we always talk about how um, Jado bottles would help. And we thought, we thought there was no way for Jado bottles to help in this, this accident um, scenario. But they, w they will attach the Jado bottles to the pallets to propel them out of the plane. And that's your pallet yeeter system. We're, it's, it, I, can see, I, can see, I can see no possible downsides to this. On, on my argument, though, I would like to point out that this is yet another accident in which reheat could have very much made a difference. Because if this aircraft had a reheat, as all wide bodies should have, it would have made it back to Dubai much faster and with much less fuel. So it would have been quite a lot lighter. You know, we sh I, I should point out, just, just so that everyone is aware, we also support the yeeting of ULDs. Um, the, Those are the unit yeeting, load devices. Yeah, the, the yeeting of ULDs, it doesn't have to be a pallet, is what I'm saying. Yeah, the ye the yeeter does not discriminate. What if they had doors at the bottom? And just opened it up and everything falls out? Right, exactly. What you are describing is Bombay doors. Yeah, so you just ditch the burning 18650s. It's perfect. All right, that's good. So we get to read the headline. Atlanta company drops cluster incendiary munitions on Dubai. Yeah, I don't see any problems, honestly. Right, do we have any more thoughts on the pallet eaters? I mean, obviously, this should be standard equipment. And um, lobby, lobby your congressman today. Patent pending, patent pending, patent pending. Okay, so what did we learn from this? Okay, so Jay, you want, you want to tell us a couple things what we learned about lithium carriages and, and packaging? We now have these wonderful rules of lithium carriage. Um, you've seen this, this sticker, um, if you're listening. It's that sticker with a bunch of batteries, one of which is broken open and has fire coming out of it that says UN3481, which is the um, uh, the the international set of rules for carrying lithium on planes. There are new regulations on the marking of, of hazmat and new definitions of what hazmat even is because, you know, prior to this accident, um, nobody really thought it was that sketchy. Um, we have a lot more sophisticated battery management systems and products. And this is partly driven by a desire for better performance and longer longevity, and, you know, longer cycle life, this kind of thing. But still, um, they also protect these batteries from being put into a state where they become unstable. 
Uh, there was a lot of industry interest in lithium iron phosphate battery chemistries. They have, a, as I said earlier, a negative thermal coefficient, so they don't burn like this. Um, they're a bit sort of gravimetrically energy, not as dense as you would want, so they don't get used in vehicles or, or that kind of thing, but a lot of sort of um, the kind of energy storage you would have if you had solar panels on your roof and you know you didn't buy it from Tesla you bought it from someone else um, those you tend to use uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries now because they're just so much safer this is yeah so one thing that was learned about containers as a result of tests that came out of this accident was that so regulations at the time required cargo area smoke detectors to sound an alarm within one minute after ignition. But testing showed that if the fire starts inside of a cargo container, it can take between two and 18 minutes after ignition of a normal cargo fire for the smoke to escape from certain types of cargo containers, which results in a potentially substantial delay in alerting the crew to the fire, during which time the fire grows in intensity inside the container basically circumventing the um, regulations. So, and also another thing they discovered was that cargo containers constructed out of supposedly fire-resistant polypropylene resulted in fires with twice the peak energy output. So it was completely counterproductive. Yeah, really, the, the key is to just to not have fires, to never, ever al not, un not know what is going on to these aircraft. Yeah. Um, another thing that came in was that there is now a rule that the largest energy capacity for a battery that you're allowed to take on a passenger flight specifically um, is 100 watt hours. Um, and as a consequence, the MacBook Pro that is currently sitting on my lap has a 99 watt hour battery for reasons that are now obvious. Um, so they, they, they introduced just a, a whole bunch of additional regulations that would hopefully prevent this from happening in the future. Yeah, and things like this are why they tell you to um, keep your electronic devices that have batteries in the passenger cabin, because if a fire starts inside the passenger cabin, ironically, it's a lot easier to detect it and keep it under control than it is if it starts in the cargo compartment because nobody can get into the cargo compartment in flight. Yeah. Uh, they've also been working to develop, uh, UPS paid a good bit of money into researching uh, smoke-resistant viewing systems. You can see one of the prototypes here on the right. Um, there's a few different variations on this, but they all sort of come to the idea that that in in zero visibility environments, you will always be able to to see the most critical instruments. Um, we also found that smoke training was being mandatory for crews. Um, I don't, we don't, we're not sure how it works. If you if you you know sort of hot box the sim, um, also the safety recommendation was section four decimal twenty. Uh, if you are a commercial pilot, uh, either either commercial passenger or commercial cargo, please please write in and let us know uh, how you do smoke training. Yeah, we'd love to know because we couldn't find any pictures of the special smoke simulator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if they if they even do this, I'm not totally sure this was genuinely a mandatory thing or if it's something that only certain airlines, like probably UPS, is doing this. But I don't know if everybody is doing it. Okay, do we have any final closing thoughts on UPS 006? Um, yeah, send my regards to Matthew Bell. Legends never die. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Matthew Bell, you're you're a hero of CPIT. Um, Kira, would you like to talk about your Patreon? Oh yeah, I have a Patreon, but I mean for my my articles, um, which you can you can contribute to and get into a Discord server that has all three of us in it. Um yeah, it's not a um it's not the CPIT Patreon. If do not do not donate it thinking you are giving money to Ariadne and and Jay, it only that money only goes to me. But one day in the future, there may be a, a um, CPIT Patreon. It could happen. It could happen. Okay. All right. Thank you everybody for joining us. Our next episode will be on Malaysia Air three seventy. As usual. See you.